opportunity to stand before these your people God I feel your anointing and I feel your glory in the house Lord in the mighty name of Jesus Lord as I made my way down the stairs to come into the sanctuary Lord I came in with entering with thanksgiving in my heart but Lord there was an aura there was an aura of praise there was an aura of worship God there was an aura of glory in the house so God I'm so thankful God that you are mindful of us that you will be willing to come in and inhabit the praises of your people. Now, God, I pray that you would empty us out, Lord, so that there may be more room for you, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, God, will be acceptable in thy sight, and that your people may have, uh, God, good ground to allow these seeds to be planted in. Lord, I bind the thickets, I bind the thorny grounds right now, I bind the stony ground right now, and I bind everything that's unlike you. Oh, God, let a spirit of worship, oh, God, continue to abide in this house. Let a spirit of praise, oh God. Continue to abide in this place, God. Let a spirit of your glory, a refreshing of your anointing, a shower of your rain, God. Oh God, let it continue to fall in this house, God, in the name of Jesus, that we may be encouraged, that a soul, souls may be saved, and God, that you will receive the glory. We're so grateful for this honor to serve and to stand before these, your people. Father, I pray that you would bind everything that's unlike you. God, we empty, God, empty us out. Empty me out, God, that I may be the vessel that you need for me to be this morning. That I may declare the word of God and declare it boldly so that lives might be changed. People might be empowered. Believers might be empowered, God, and the captives may be set free. Get the glory even now, God. It's in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus Christ we pray. We say thank God, amen, and amen. Come on, let's give God a hand clap of praise. Come on, put some praise on your lips as well, for he is worthy. He is mighty to save from everlasting to everlasting. He alone is God. He's a great God. He's a mighty God. He's a wonderful God. He's a loving God. He's a compassionate God. He's a merciful God. He is a God that is above all, sits high and looks low. There's nobody like him. There's no one that can compare. He's magnificent and glorious. And we bless his name this morning. Hallelujah. 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 While you're standing, turn quickly with me to the book of Habakkuk. We'll be reading the last verse in the book of Habakkuk. I know that this is one of our obscure books of the Bibles that we don't go to, um, but it's in the back near Jonah, got Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum. If you need me to go back further, got Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, then Habakkuk. Habakkuk is right before, I mean, somewhere near uh, before the New Testament. So if you work your way to Matthew and then work your way back towards the front, it's probably three or four, five or so books before there. Yeah, somewhere around there, brother. You're getting close. What book are you looking at right now? Did you say where you at? What book were you looking at? I want you to see the word. No, I wanted to see where you were at. Habakkuk, chapter 3. Verse 19, we'll be reading, and it's important for us. We're going to be going through the entire book of Habakkuk. The message is, it's on this story, on this writing, on this prophecy um, that the Lord spoke into the life of Judah and into the life of the Babylonians at that time. But in Habakkuk, chapter 3, we'll be reading verse 19. It is the last verse in this book. And the Bible says this. The Lord God is my strength, and he will make my feet like hinds feet, and he will make me to walk upon mine high places to the chief singer on my string instruments. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord on this morning. The Lord God is my strength. And he will make my feet like hinds feet and he will make me to walk upon my high 
places or mine high places for a few moments this morning uh, because we have a full day ahead of us i would like to preach from the subject god sees god knows god acts god sees god knows god acts and as i prepared my heart and my mind uh, for this morning's message, it's amazing how many resources that I was able to find in regard to the book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk is one of the unknown prophets. He's one of the prophets that uh, we, we, we only know about him according to the prophecy that was written and that was captured by him. The prophecy that was written to um, the nation of Judah and the nation of Babylon as well. Habakkuk was one of the few prophets who actually had a message that was designated or directed towards another nation outside of Israel and outside of Judah. We don't know much about Habakkuk other than God anointed him to prophesy to these two nations. His book is located in the Old in the Old Testament in the area of the minor prophets. Now we have our major prophets, you know, Isaiah, Jeremiah, uh, uh, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel. Those are our major prophets. But then after that, we have some minor prophets that uh, the books weren't. Uh, we didn't hear much about these people, and we didn't know much about their stories. But uh, if just for your information. Habakkuk was a, a contemporary of Jeremiah. He was a contemporary of Ezekiel and Daniel. Now, Ezekiel and Daniel came about after Habakkuk was on the scene, um, but he also was a contemporary of Zephaniah and Nahum. Now, Habakkuk, we don't know much about him, but his name means embracer or wrestler and or wrestler. And it provides keys to his prophecy um, that we will read about today. Uh, now, Habakkuk came upon the scene when the world was in both a state of hope and in a state of confusion. And what's amazing and what we have to understand is that uh, prior to Habakkuk's coming, the nation of Israel had already gone through its cycle of sin. For you all that don't know where the cycle of sin is, it's at the cycle where we're in the will of God. But as we get away from the will of God, then we begin to worship and allow other things to get into the way of our relationship with God. And the further we get away from the core of the righteousness of God, then we find ourselves in a state, a state of despair because we are disconnected or because because we are far away from God. And I need to stop by and stop right here just to let you know it does not matter if you're not a smoker. It does not matter if you're do not doing drugs. It does not matter if you're not murdering somebody. If you are a consistent liar, if you are a consistent doubter, if you are a consistent person that's not faithful to God and don't try or don't take time to read God's word, then God sees you just the same as the whoremonger, as the idolater, as the person that's doing sins that we think is great in our own eyes we try to put sins on pedestals and certain sins don't do the same things we say but sin is is all uncleanness before god sin is all unrighteousness before god and i don't want to go to hell just because i'm unfaithful to god or i don't want to obey god's word and so they found themselves to be in a state of uh, um, despair in this moment and in this time but beforehand, then, uh, the Assyrians, they had previously swept over the land. And oftentimes what we do is when we find ourselves in trouble and we find ourselves in certain situations, we constantly find ourselves calling or we have a willingness to call on God. If I'm lacking some money, I don't have no problem calling on God. If I'm sick in my body, I don't have a problem calling on God. If I got somebody acting crazy around me and I'm in my right mind, I don't have a problem calling on God. But when things around me are at peace and and things are calm and all my money is right in it and all my children are acting right in it and my spouse or my significant other is all good and gone and this oftentimes we don't find ourselves having a thirst and a hunger for the Lord and when we lose that hunger and when we lose that, that thirst for God then we find ourselves becoming weak and we find ourselves becoming distant from God because when we are hungry and when we are thirsty we'll seek after the Lord and it does not matter what's going on in our lives we have to have that hunger and that thirst to seek after God because when we have that hunger and thirst then we'll find ourselves we'll remain connected to him and when we can remain connected to him then he gives us everything that we need and more 
But the children of Judah, the nation of Judah, found themselves disconnected from God again. Because years previously, during the reigns of King Ahaz and Manasseh and Ammon, they found themselves doing those things that are evil in the eyesight of the Lord. Now, you guys got to understand, the people of Judah were a blessed nation. It was the offspring of the nation of Israel, but it was the two nations that God allowed David's seed to continue to reign over. Because he promised to David that I'm not going to take the seed of kingship out of your lineage. I don't care what's going on afterwards. I'm not going to take it from you. So this tract of the nation of Israel, which was the nation of Judah, was supposed to be the ones that had the God on their mind. You all remember Judah contained Jerusalem and Jerusalem was the holy land of God. That's where uh, King Solomon built the temple and that's where he built that grand temple that David wanted to build but God would not allow him to build it. So that's actually where the presence of the Lord abided at for the nation of Judah and the nation of Israel. We need to make sure that we hold on to those old landmarks. We can't allow things to come into our lives just because seasons change and people's change God remains to be the same I preached about that a couple of weeks ago and I won't go back into it but God still remains the same but for some reason the devil crept in unaware in Jerusalem and they began to think more highly of themselves than they ought to have thought. They, they began to allow the things that are around them to come in and to creep in unaware. You have to be careful what you allow to remain to be around you. Lady Yo and I was looking at TV last night because there was a power outage. And, uh, and, and, and with the power outage, our direct TV, you know, some I'm trying to get cheaper, in, in, cheaper cable and got direct TV. And it don't always work right. But uh, so we had to go to Netflix and go into Netflix. Netflix and we look at one movie and, and, and in this movie every other word was a cuss word and, and we tried to allow, we tried to hold on just a little bit to see whether it was going to stop but it would not stop so it was in it was hindering our spirit so that means that we had to turn it and find something else. You have to be careful what you allow to remain around you because those things will creep in unaware. I had a dream last night and for some reason a curse word came into my dream Then that was just for a little bit of exposure from things that was not common to my ears. We have to be careful what we allow to reside around us. We need to cast away those things that are unlike God because the devil wants to come in and steal, kill, and to destroy. And he's not going to just do it in a grand way, but he's a sneaker. He's a sneakster. If I, he's a trickster. And he's not, he's not, he's very sneaky. That's the word I want to do. There you go. And so he'll sneak in with something that's little. And then as you allow, you become comfortable with those things that are little. Then he begins to take bigger and bigger steps. And the more you allow him to remain there, then he'll take more and more control. And the nation of Judah found themselves in a state of apostasy because they were being led by wicked men. They were being led by King Ahaz and King Manasseh and King Emma. So I need to stop here. And let you know you have to make sure you following people that are doing the right thing by God if I'm not following you or, or, or leading you to Christ then you need to question who you are following after if I'm leading you the wrong way you need to question who you following after because you don't want to allow anyone to lead you to hell there's no reason to be in church all day offering all of your sacrifices and being led by someone who is defiled who is not doing right by the eyesight of God who's preaching preaching outside of the will of God who's preaching from a book instead of preaching from the word of God we have to be careful who we are following we have to be careful you can't just eat at everybody's table you got to watch out what you're looking at on TV because those people on TV don't care about you all right so we have to be careful and because the leadership is wicked and that's what the devil do he comes and get the leaders he comes and get the heads and because if the head is cut off then the body can't do nothing but just flail along how many of y'all have seen, some of y'all have lived in the country. I know Missionary Miller is from California, but Barstow is the country. So I'm sure she's seen um, heads of chickens cut off. And when those chickens' heads are cut off, come on, thank you, Mother Green. Them chickens just be running around and you wonder what is going on with them crazy chickens. Why don't it just die? But there is still light in the body. But when you don't have a head guiding you, when you don't have wisdom guiding you, when you don't have the Lord guiding you, you're just running around like a chicken with his head cut off. You're wondering why you're running into stuff that you should not be running into. You're wondering why you're dealing with situations in your life that you should not be dealing with. And so the nation of 
Judah, they found themselves in a state of headlessness because they were being led by wicked men. We must make sure that we continually pray for our leaders. I need, I urge you all to continue to fervently call my name out in prayer uh, because the more that I deal with and the more that I'm doing for the Lord, the greater the challenges that are coming my way. And the devil wants to do everything to stop me from doing the will of God. He wants me to be discouraged. He wants me to stop praying. He wants me to stop being faithful uh, because I'm not seeing what I want to see. And so I urge you all to continue to pray for the leader. Uh, I pray for Bishop Thomas all the time that God would strengthen him because I know as my leader goes, then I go. And the greater my leader is, then the greater I can be. The more powerful my leader is, the more powerful I can be because the anointing, it runs down Aaron's beard. What you all need, if you pray for your pastor, if you pray for your first lady, then God can't help but to come to your rescue because they're the ones that are watching for your soul. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So we must be careful when we allow things to come into our pathways. And I go to all of this to say that God sees and God knows and God acts. And he found that when he saw them, he found them to be in a state of inconsistency. He found them to be in a state of idolatry. And when he finds us in that state, he has to take his hedges from around us. I found myself and I'm about to get in trouble, but the truth shall set you free. I have an issue with the, uh, the easy pass lane. It's a spirit that takes over me that causes me to jump into the carpool lane, the easy pass, when I don't have easy pass people in the cars with me. And the story tells me that this likewise story is that God is merciful. I'm telling you all this because God is merciful and, and kind to you even when you know that you are doing wrong. And at one point in day and time, you need to understand that God's going to bring it to your attention that you are doing wrong. And it just so happened last week I had a meeting with a police officer right as I exited the easy pass. Now I had been doing everything and getting away with it and God was merciful and God was still kind and he let me get away and let me go through. But at some point in time when you're doing wrong, God is going to step in and going to remove the hedges away from you. And when God removes the hedges away from you, you are in the hands of an unjust person. You're in the hands of an unjust devil that don't care about you but even when you do wrong and God removes his hedges he's not going to allow the enemy to destroy you you can you, you can do wrong and sin is going to be the wages of your sin it, you're going to have to deal with the wages of sin is death but God the gift of God is that God is going to still be merciful unto you so God sees God sees what you are doing God knows what you are doing. And when God comes in and did an inspection on the children of Israel, children of Judah, he found that they had lost their love for him. You got to understand that God knows when you love him and when you really mean something to him. Because he knows that those that you love, you spend time with. If you're not spending your time in prayer, God sees that you're not spending time in prayer to him. You ain't talking to him. You're not communicating with him. You're not taking time to read his word. God sees what you are doing. And and God is merciful enough to be compassionate upon you every single day. Even when you turn your back on him and you turn away from him, if God allows you to see another day, that's the mercy of God allowing you to rise up and to see another day. God's doing it because God still wants to do something for you. God's still doing it even when you are in sin, even though you may be in sin, God is still being merciful because God still have greater plans for your life. And so he found them. And he looked at the children of Judah and he found that they were worshiping idol gods. He found that they were doing the things that were outside of the, what the law had told them to do, that what the law had explained for them not to do. Don't have any other gods before me. Don't cover your neighbor's stuff and don't steal and don't kill and don't do those things. And he found them doing the things that were contrary to what the word of God had told them to do. And so he allowed the Assyrian nation to come and, and not be seized 
teach them and not to berate them, but just to cause them to go in an affliction. You need to know that when affliction comes your way, it's either God trying to get your attention to do what's right or God trying to get your attention to take you to another level. When God sees what you're doing, God sees both sides. God sees both sides. Follow me as I go here. He sees when you're doing wrong and he knows when you're doing wrong, but he also sees when you are doing right and he knows what you're doing when you're doing those right things. God is just not a, a person that a God is not, not like where he just sees things that he wants to see, but he's so infinite and omnipresent in his ways that he remains to be there even when you are sitting and even when you are doing right as well. I'm talking about the omnipotence of God and the greatness of God, not your state, but the God that we serve. You need to understand that God loves you when you see it and God loves you when you when you do those things that are right in his eyes as well. And you want to experience and dwell in the love of God and not deal in the chastisement of the Lord. And so he had to chastise them. He had to remove his hedges from around them. And as he removed his hedges around them, he allowed the Assyrians to afflict them. But great, the God is that we serve that when we call upon him and we go around into the cycle of sin where we become afflicted and we begin to call on the name of God, then God comes to our rescue. When we say, God, I'm sorry. God, I, I messed up. And God, I made a mistake. God, I thank you for being awesome. God, I thank you for being wise. God, I thank you for knowing my plight. God, I need you to see me right where where I'm at and God comes in and say I see that your heart is right and pure before me and now I will allow you to come through and come out of your thing but I need you all to know that when we sin we sow seeds that we have to reap the law of seed time and harvest is a law that goes for when you're doing good and a law for when you're doing bad as well it just so happens when you sow bad things you're going to reap bad things that are more than what you actually sold but also when you do good things you're going to reap even better things because God don't give back to you what you give he always exponentially grows what comes back to you and so when King Josiah came into office and then the kingdom, he tore down all of those things, the idols that they had made to Baal, the groves that they had made to Baal, and he called the next gen. It was amazing that Josiah was just a young boy when he came into power in, uh, in, in Judah, but he got them back to the spirit of righteousness and got them back to the spirit of holiness. And so he brought them back, uh, but again, they found themselves to be complacent. After years of living right, they became, they got to be complacent. You have to watch yourself and when you think it's okay not to come to service. When you think it's okay not to spend some time with the Lord. You got to be watchful when you don't feel like reading the Bible and you know you hadn't read it. Or you got to be watchful. You may have found yourself in a state of complacency. And when you don't have a hunger and a thirst for God, you're in a state of complacency. When you don't long to be in the presence of the Lord, you're in a state of complacency. And you're going further and further away. Away from the Lord. Write down this scripture. God sees and God knows and God acts. Write down 2 Kings 6 and 12. I, I'm, I'm almost done. I just need to go through these things because uh, I need you to know that God sees your situation. And even when you fall outside of the will of God, even when you disconnect yourself from God, God sees you, God knows you, and God will act on your behalf. 2 Kings chapter 6 verse 12 says, and one of of his servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha, the prophet that is in Israel, telleth the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bedchamber. God knows what you are doing even in the intimacy of your bedroom. There is no place that you can hide from the Lord. When you're doing wrong in darkness, God can see you. God knows what you're doing. When you're lying on your time card, when you're deceiving somebody, at the supermarket when you took that extra change and you knew that change was not yours at the store God sees what you are doing we have to know that without a shadow of a doubt that God sees where we are at write down Proverbs 15 and 3 Proverbs 15 and 3 where it declares that the eyes of the Lord are in every place let me go back hold on just write down 
Proverbs 15 and 3. It's amazing about the, the second king story uh, because God will fight. That can go with God acts as well because uh, the, the, the people at that time were berating Israel. And what he was doing, God was making a way of escape for them every single time. They were making plans against them, but every time they made a plan against them, um, God would show them where the plan was going to and direct them in another way. You need to know that God sees what you are doing. Thank you, Holy Spirit. But God also sees what the enemy is trying to do to you as well. He sees what the enemy is doing and the enemy can't do it without the permission of the Lord. He cannot afflict you. He cannot overcome you. He cannot come and attack you unless the Lord God gives him permission to do it. And so you got to know that you know that you know that when things come your way that God has your back. Every single time they tried to set a trap for them, God made a way out of no way. It was the king of Syria, thank you Holy Ghost, that kept trying to set traps for them. And every time he set a trap in his inner circle, God made a way of escape for those that were his. You need to know that when you're in the will of God, God sees the traps that the enemy is trying to set for you. And when you see God, when you see God and his favor and his grace, God will make a way out of no way. God will open up your eyes so that you can see. And God will close doors that are against you and that are there to hinder you as well. So I gave you that scripture because God knows what the enemy is doing in the intimate areas of his place as well as he knows what you are doing in the intimacy of your place as well. Proverbs 15 and 3. And I'm going back between us and the enemy because that's what the story of Habakkuk is about. It's about us, what they were doing and what the enemy was doing and what God was going to do to both of us. All right, Proverbs 15 and 3. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. Come on, I don't need to go no more on that one. He knows what the evil people are doing and he knows what the good people are doing. Write down Jeremiah 23 and 24. It says this, can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him, said the Lord? Do not I feel heaven and earth, says the Lord? So God knows and God sees, not, not knows yet, God sees what we are doing. And he wants to know whether we're going to be about our father's business or not. God is continuously looking at us because what we are doing is important to him. You need to understand that everything that you do is important to the Lord. When you wake up in the morning, it's important that you wake up. That's why he allowed you to wake up. When you take time to pray and give him thanks for the brand new day, it's important to him because you've given him the authority or you've given him honor and praise that he woke you up that morning. When you find yourself walking around praising him and magnifying him. It's important to him because he loves to hear the praises of his name. He loves for us to lift up his name because he wants to inhabit our praises. God sees when we go throughout our day. God sees everything that's going on. There's nothing that God does not see that's going on in your life. I'm a fan of the Matrix. And what's amazing about the Matrix is that everything that they were doing, people were looking at what they were doing. That's what God does. God sees what's going on. And it's not just he sees what I'm doing. He sees what you're doing as well because God is so omnipotent and great that he can be in multi omnipresent, that he can be in multiple places at once. We can't be. I wish that I can be in multiple places at once uh, because yesterday I had to be in Baltimore, but I would have loved to have been in Chesapeake with my wife. And from what I understood, my wife would have loved to have been in Baltimore with me, but she found herself in Chesapeake but God doesn't give us the power of omnip or omnipresence but God is the only one that's omnipresent so when I'm looking uh, at a situation and I'm looking at a trial and you also are looking at a situation and looking at a trial God can be in the same place at once breaking through for you and opening up doors for you and making ways for you as well write down Psalm 139 verses 7 through 9 Psalm 139, it says, Whither shall I go from thy spirit? David said, Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand shall hold me. I'm just trying to make sure you all understand it does not matter where you at. God sees what's going on. God sees what's happening around you. God sees the circumstances of your life and God knows where you are at and if 
God knows where you're at, you need to understand that if you just call upon him, he promised that he will answer you. God knows he, does. he don't have to look. He don't have to go into Google Maps to find you, but he knows exactly where you are at. He knows exactly what the enemy is trying to do to you. He knows exactly what's going on in your life, and you can depend upon him because God sees where you are at. He knows where you're weak at. He knows where you're not as strong at. And he knows how to encourage you and to build you up and to make you stronger. God knows. Write down uh, Jeremiah 29 and 11. We recite this all the time, but we need to repeat it for this morning. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, said the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. God knows what's going on in your life. That's why he finds himself seeing everything that's going on. And he knows the plans that he has for your life. But we got to believe God knows what he's doing. Oftentimes we don't believe that God knows what he's doing because otherwise we would go to God before we make the decisions that we make we make so many decisions and we don't consult God we don't know that God knows that that's going to be a bad thing you should, you probably shouldn't do that um, but if we don't talk to God God ain't going to give us the answer uh, so we got, to, we got to understand that God knows what he's doing and since he knows what he's doing he wants you to have an expected end and not to go into places that are going to harm you and to hurt you and to kill you write down Psalm 47 1 4 47 and 5. Psalm 147 and 5. The Bible says, Great is our Lord and of great power. His understanding is infinite, meaning there is no limitations to what God knows. God knows our ending from our beginning, meaning if he knows our ending from our beginning, that means he works his way back to right where we need him the most. We think that we need him here, but God says, no, you can be seasoned just a little bit, and you need to understand that trials and afflictions, they don't last always. Now, the Bible says that the suffering of this present time cannot be compared to the glory that shall be revealed. That means that we are going to have to go through some suffering, but God knows that this trial and this affliction it's going to draw you near to him and also make you trust him the more. So he knows his understanding is infinite. Write down Isaiah 40 and 28, another familiar passage that we know. It says, has thou not known? Has thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. The God that we serve does not get tired. It doesn't matter if you get tired. It doesn't matter if you get weary. It doesn't matter if you get distracted. The God that we serve never gets weary. He never gets tired. He's the one that created the beginning and the ending. He is the first and the last. He is Alpha and he's Omega. He's everything and more. And so God never gets weary. He knows exactly what you need and more. There's no searching of his understanding. Write down Matthew 10 and 30. It says, but the very hairs of your head are all numbered. God knows. And I know I don't have many hairs on my head, but he knows every single one that's on the top of my head. And not only does God sees, God knows, but God acts as well. Write down John 16 and 33. I'm trying to give you all scriptures because I need you all to know that no matter what state you might find yourself in, God knows where you are at and God knows what you need and more. John 16 and 33 says, these things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulations, but tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. God will act on your behalf. That though you may go into tribulation and go into trials, God knows that it's going to come, but you need to know that God already has given you the victory. It doesn't matter the weapons that's formed against you. They won't prosper because God has already overcome the snares and the traps that the enemy is trying to set your way. God will act on your behalf. Right now, Exodus 14 and 14. Where the Bible declares that the Lord shall fight for you. That's all you got to do is hold your peace. Stop talking and stop worrying about what's going on in your life. God's going to come to your rescue because God sees and God knows. And because God sees and God knows, he's going to act. When the enemy comes up against you like a flood, the Bible tells us that the Lord will lift up a standard before you. So he knows what you need. He knows when he needs to act. He knows when you need him to come to your rescue. You just need to hold your peace. And let the Lord fight your battle. Write down 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 15, where it declares, And the Lord, and he said, Hearken ye all Judah 
and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou King Jehoshaphat, thus said the Lord unto you, be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God. You need to know that God is going to act on your behalf. It does not matter who's against you. You own your job and you wonder why God still has you in this place. You need to know that God sees and God knows and God acts. You need to understand, though you may be having trouble in your relationship, though things may be chaotic in your home, God sees and God knows. That's all you got to do is understand that God will come to your rescue and God will act on your behalf. He told the, the, the people of Judah and Habakkuk, Habakkuk made this this song, uh, a song of praise and the song of praise was the Lord God is my strength. You got to know that you know that you know that God will be your strength. He'll be a strength like none other, the songwriter said, because God sits high and God sits low, I mean looks low and he knows just what you need and more. They went through trial because of sin. They went through affliction because of sin but you need to know that God won't put no more on you than you can bear. That's when you go, that's when you're being attacked by sin but that's also when you are, are, are going through life uh, uh, take time to read Job take time to read Job God gave him limitations on what he can do and if the enemy tried to go past those limitations God would have punished the enemy uh, you need to know that your enemy is not just coming by your way but they are ordained for your life the enemy that you deal with, the trials that you deal with, the storms that come in your life, God has to ordain them for your life. They don't just come by just by happenstance, but he asked, he asked the devil, he says, had you considered my servant Job? Oh God, glory to your name this morning. Had you considered that person? When you're going through, God considered you for it. God knew what you did, what can do. He knew what he can do. He knew what the enemy can do and he won't let the enemy do more than he allows him to do he won't let him do any more so when the enemy try to come up against you and do more than what God ordained for you God gonna come and bless you and he gonna curse that enemy if you take time to read Habakkuk, Habakkuk was like, Lord, why are you doing this to the people? Why are you allowing this wicked generation, these wicked people? The Babylonians was King Nebuchadnezzar. They came to wipe out Jerusalem. They came to destroy Jerusalem, but they had to be destroyed because they had lost their first love. When you lose your first love, God takes things out of your way that's more important to him than him. And so he allowed this affliction to come, and, and Habakkuk was, uh, he was somebody that he, he questioned God. Well, God why are you allowing this to happen to your people? And God explained to him, it's because they have sinned and because they've fallen out of love with me. And because they've fallen out of love with me, I can't keep my hedges of protection around them. And they got to go through a period of time where they're going to have to learn to love me again. Uh, but at the end of all this, he told them that uh, when they do wrong, he said, because I'm going to let you know they're going to do more than they should do. Uh, I'm going to abuse them and I'm going to crush them and I'm going to destroy them because I I've only given them a limit on what they should be doing to my people. You need to know that God has your back and that God is going to fight for you. He's not going to let the enemy to destroy you. If you hold on to him, he's not going to let the enemy to destroy you. If you pray and take time to meditate on him, God is not going to allow the enemy to destroy you. You may go through some trials and you may go through some tribulations and you may go through some storms in your life, but God wants you to have a praise and he wants you to have have a praise enough to say God is my strength I may be weak in my body I may be sick in my body but God is still yet my strength I may not have a lot of money in my pocket I may not have things going right in my home but God still is my strength can you have the audacity enough to do uh, create a song of praise to God in the midst of your affliction in the midst of your trial can you say for, for though you slay me yet will I trust you yet will I believe in you yet will I hope in you yet will I trust in you God can you do that in the midst of your trials, in the midst of your tribulations, in the midst of your storm? We have to know that God just wants a, a song of praise to us. Come on, son. He just wants us a song of praise for him. The whole chapter of verse, uh, chapter three of Habakkuk is a song of praise. 
He sung the praise to God because he wanted to reverence God. Even though God had spoken judgment against Judah, he let them know that uh, uh, the, the, the judgment won't be forever. And that the enemy won't reign over you forever. And that if you can just sing a song of praise, even before the battle is over, if you can just hold on and say, God, I know that you're going to bring me through. I, I know that I, I may have fallen short of you. God, huh, bring me back near to thee. I'm sorry, God. And when you're living right, God, I know that this affliction won't last forever, but it's going to work all together for my good. God just wants us to sing a song to him. He just wants us to sing a song of praise and worship because he alone is God. And what this song does that Habakkuk wrote, the Lord God is my strength. He'll make my feet like hind's feet. I can, that's a whole other way I can go with that one. And he will make, my, make me to walk upon mine high places. Look at that. Judah was afflicted. They were going to be overran by the Babylonians. But Hezekiah had enough audacity to sing a song that says, God is still my strength. That when you're weakness, you're going to understand that God will make you strong. And that these, when he made his feet like hind's feet, he made it so that he would be able to overcome and climb over all of the carnage that was going to happen, all of the damage, all of the hurt, all of the ill feelings, all of the things that that caught that tried to weigh you down. He's going to make your feet like hind's feet and allow you to overcome no situation. Meaning he's going to let you overcome every obstacle that the devil tried to set before you. Because guess what? Look at the end of that verse, 319. He says, and he will make me to walk upon mine high places, meaning that God has high places ordained for you. Each and every one of us, God has ordained us for greater, especially for those here at Praise Center. He wants greater for us. He's he not satisfied, and you should not be satisfied where you're at, but God has something more for you. He's going to make your feet like hind feet because trouble and things are going to come your way. But you need to know that God's going to fight for you. You need to know that God sees you, that God knows what's going on, and God is going to act on your behalf. And when he acts on your behalf, he's going to make you to walk upon your high places. Whatever your high place may need to be, God has it already ordained and already has it waiting for you to get there. That's all you need to do is say, God, make my feet like hinds feet, Lord. I need you to carry me through. I need you to help me along the way. I need you to continue to fight for me. I need you to continue to stand with me. I need you to continue to breathe in me. And as I do that, then what's going to happen is that when you should be down, you'll find yourself praising God because you've made up in your mind that God's going to bring me through. Uh, does anybody have a, enough faith to be able to declare, God, I know that you're going to bring me through. I may not look, it may not look like it. It may not seem like everything is working working out for my good, but to can declare that God, I know you're going to bring me through. God, I know you're going to bring me over. God, I know you're going to make the way. God, I know you're going to open up the door. God, I know that you're going to heal. God, I know that you're going to deliver. God, I know that you're going to set free. That's all you got to do is begin to speak it into your life. And it's not anything that you're speaking, but you're speaking the word of God. God sees God knows, God acts. Habakkuk said, after God explained to him why he was going to afflict the Judah and why he was going to come and destroy the Babylonians, he let Habakkuk know that I got it under control. I see what's going on, I know what's going on, and I'm going to act. And because Habakkuk heard God's word, Habakkuk had the boldness and audacity to declare, the Lord God is my strength. And God's going to bring me through. And he's going to take me to my high places. Come on, resting on your feet in the house of the Lord this morning. Father in heaven, we thank you for what you have given us to preach about this morning. I pray that something was said and done to encourage these, your people. To remind them that you are an omnipotent God, an omnipresent God. And that there is nothing too hard for you. That he knows that you know exactly where they are at and more. And not just them, but he knows where the enemy is at as well. Help me to remind them. I pray that they were hurt. They heard me and they heard the reminder that the enemy can't do anything unless you give him permission to do it. So we need to stay in the will of God. Because if we're in the perfect will of God, you will always fight for us. Help us to hold on to you. And God, I ask that you would make our feet like hinds feet. 
So, Lord, that we may be able to overcome doubt, that we may be able to overcome fear, that we may be able to overcome trials and tribulations, sickness, death, and those things that come against us to try to cause us not to be effective in you victorious in you an overcomer in you lord i pray that you would help us to walk in our high places because you have something greater in store for every single one of us lord i've given what your people needed today i pray that they have heard the word and will apply it to their day-to-day -day lives let it fall on good soil it's in the mighty and matchless name of jesus christ we pray we say thank god amen and amen keep your heads bowed real quick if, if there's anyone in the house that needs prayer I don't do this often enough, and I need to do it more. I need you to know that God sees, and I just want to touch and agree with you. You may not see what God sees, but I need you to know that God sees where you are at, and God wants to come and deal with your situation. God just needs to know that you're willing and trusting enough to allow him to do it. If you need any prayer, any request, make your request made known now. Let the Lord know. And as I pray one more time, make your request made known now. Let God know. God, I, I understand you see this situation. And God, I understand that you know this situation. And God, your word tells me that you promised that you were going to act on my behalf. That you would never leave me nor ever forsake me. That you would be with me unto the end. And Lord, so I put this care into your hands. And Lord, I trust that you're going to act according to your will for my life and for this situation's life and for this individual's life. God, I thank you right now. And I pray, God, that you will hear the pleas and hear the cries and hear the requests of your people. Come to their rescue, God. Open up doors, oh God. Make ways out of no way, God. Perform the miracle. God, you do the impossible, God. And I put my trust in you on this day. Strengthen your people. Breathe life into them. Encourage them. Embrace them. Hold on to them. And bless your people. It's in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus Christ we pray. We say thank God, amen, and amen. You may be seated.